Welcome to Always Real Talk. I'm Kwame Brown. We know that 39% of marriages are failing in the United States of America. I had a good friend who introduced me to a power couple. That's right, a power couple who wrote a phenomenal book uh, called Maximizing Marriages. It's Dr. Uh, Serelda and Victor Herbin. And we have with us in the studio Dr. Herbin. They have a two part book, like one wrote one half of the book and the other wrote the other half of the book. So we thought that we'd do a two-part series with each of them describing why they wrote the chapters uh, that they wrote in their book. So I'd like to welcome uh, my new friend, uh, Dr. Herbin. Welcome to Always Real Talk. Good evening, good evening, Kwame. Thank you for having me on the show today. It's a, definitely an honor for us to uh, be able to talk about the book and share our experiences with others. So thank you very much for that. No, no, a absolutely, absolutely. And, and I want to say the book was, was, was uh, written by both you and your husband, and that's why you're on the show, to talk about uh, this book. Now, let's talk about where we are today in the society. You and I know that COVID-19 is rampant all over the world, especially here in the U.S. And, you know, now we have people that are losing their jobs, we have people that uh, have a less of an income, so they're underemployed. Uh, we have individuals that are now home, right? And you and I know we have people that don't even like each other that are now home with each other every single day, right? Now, a lot of times they would go to work and she would go to work and she would go to work and they don't got to be around each other. Then they come home and they tolerate each other and then they go back to work, right? And, uh, but now they're all stuck in the house together. We have abusers that are stuck in the house and they can't go anywhere. We're, we have another show that we'll talk about that. But you guys put together this book, Maximizing Marriages, which I think is so relevant today as we go into, get out of the COVID environment, but also into the holiday season in which, as you know, you have articulated in your book some of the reasons why marriages fail. One, being people are married, marrying young. Two, limited education. Three, income. And four, premarital pregnancy. Um, Tell us about this book. Tell us about what has what inspired both you and your husband to actually write the book together, right? A lot of times it'd be like the woman writing the book over here, uh, you know, the man writing the book over here. People got divorced, and now they're writing the book about the divorce. But you guys took time to write this book together. Why? Well, first I will say, and I'll put a plug in, wear your mask. COVID is real. I actually contracted COVID in June. Uh, and just this past weekend, Kwame, my entire family tested positive for COVID. So my whole household has been affected by COVID. We are all well. I'm still recovering from taste and smell. I can't taste and smell anything. So don't make fun of me because all of my food tastes like cardboard. Uh, but otherwise, we are doing fine. I'm glad that you brought that up. And thank you for uh, your concern in regards to COVID. But in terms of us writing the book, um, one day we were on a cruise in, on our 18th anniversary and God said, write a book. And the book is going to be two parts. We were married 18 years that year. And so nine chapters will come from my husband and nine chapters will come from me. Uh, my husband, as you will find out when he does his part of this interview, he did not buy that message. He was like, God didn't tell me that. So I ain't writing it. I was like, okay, he doesn't have to tell you. He told me. So if we're one, it's okay. So it took him a while to come around. And basically he wrote part one, which was the first nine chapters. And I wrote part two, which were the um, second half, which was the last nine chapters. So it actually came together very well. Um, I think because we were talking and coaching with so many different couples uh, informally and people were just coming to us and gravitating to us, trying to figure out uh, how do we do it with all of the things that we do in our lives, with children, careers, um, serving in the, the military, serving in the army as officers. There was so much going on in our lives and people were always asking us, how do we do it? And I believe that was the, the precursor for God saying, write the book, because more than just you need to know your story. Oh, OK. So, you know, he finally said, OK, after you was like, this was the vision that God gave me. And he said, well, God ain't give me that vision. Uh, but then finally, I guess, you know, you guys got together and got the book written. But, uh, you know, the book is, is, is a really good book. Uh, you know, you'll see it on the screen shortly. I advise people go out, check it out, get it. It's on Amazon. It's everywhere. It's easy to find. Um, I, I want to start talking about this first chapter. Like you're, you're writing this book and you 
you want to put it together, and I'm pretty sure you had a lot of stuff to say, right? How did you guys come up with who's going to write the first half, who's going to, because you're, you're the second half of the book. You're not the first half. He's the first half, and right. you're the second half. How did, how did he become the first half when he didn't want to write the book to begin with? Um, well, I mean, the first chapter really kind of sets the tone, man uh, in the house versus man of the house. So, you know, I deferred to him and asked him if he wanted to um, do the first couple of chapters. And he said it was fine. I didn't have a problem being the last uh, nine chapters. So one way or the other, it didn't really matter to me where I was placed. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the story uh, actually got out in the the experience experiences got out. Now, in terms of the chapters um, that you asked me about, we did not know what chapters we were going to write until right before we published the book a week prior to publishing. We did not share any information, and it was amazing how much of the information was quite similar, of course, from a man's perspective and a woman's perspective. But some of the titles and some of the content in those chapters uh, were definitely similar, which was a good thing because we've been married 18 years, so we should agree on some things, right? Right, right. Well, I, I you know, I want to go right to, because uh, I had to put the chapters in front of me because I can't remember all 18 chapters, right? So I want to go get the chapters in front of me, and you know, I will go to chapter 15, because okay. you know, he he's got a lot of them that I need to ask some questions about, but I'm on <laughs> you today, so I want to go straight to chapter 15. It says, "The greener turf, I mean grass." What is that chapter about? So basically, it talks about us not allowing other outside people or entities to enter our marriage. Many times people look at about the, um, you know, that chapter about the greener turf. I mean, grass. Basically, I'm saying you think that the grass is greener on the other side and what you actually see with your eyes could be enticing, but it's not sustaining. And many times when we look over at our neighbor's grass and it's amazing because my, my neighbor, when we moved in the neighborhood, he said, how could you all's grass be so green? I want to do what you all are doing. You know, that's a good compliment. But, you know, maybe my neighbor couldn't afford what we did. And I'm not putting anybody down in my neighborhood. I'm just making an example. But that's a very simple example to talk about what I'm mentioning in the book for marriage. We can't go outside of our marriage and look upon somebody else's household or gaze upon someone else of the opposite sex or same sex for that matter and say that, okay, this is better for me because we're having an argument. This is better for me because I don't feel like it today. It's just not the right thing. And I think once we realize and we settle in that this marriage belongs to us and that the marriage is ours and we work at what we have, the grass th doesn't look as green. It's pretty, but it's not grass that I want to walk on. Okay, and because I was trying to, you know, I've kind of, when I saw grass and green, you know, you get old enough, you know what that means. The grass is not green on the other side, you know, whatever that saying says. Um, right. and, um, and we'll get to some more of that in a little while. But when I talked about, when I looked at this thing called, how are you managing the windows? Right now, I've heard the grass ain't green on the other side. I know ain't ain't a word, but I'm gonna say ain't anyway because green ain't green on the side. I got that. Don't don't stop me saying because I said ain't right. But I want to get back to managing your windows. Like, why did you write that chapter, and how did that chapter come to be? Well, I will tell you one of the stories as to why I wrote that chapter. What inspired me was really my upbringing. Uh, I wasn't raised by my parents. My mom was a drug addict. My dad introduced her, and I never really met him. Um, so growing up, uh, managing my windows was very difficult because I only felt that I had one window. You know, I was raised by my grandmother. Uh, I was basically raised by the church. I was raised by the band director. I was raised by the high school principal. So I was raised by a village, literally. And to be able to see myself through one window the majority of my life and then move into adulthood, go into the military, establish my own identity uh, after being an adult, really, um, it showed me that I was not one faceted, that I was not destined for the things that I saw around me and, and to become a product of my environment that was set up for me. I was an at-risk child, didn't know it until I wrote my other book, From At Risk to At the Top. But knowing those things now uh, in a marriage, you cannot keep your windows closed. 
You know, Jahari window is a um, term that some scientists came up with in terms of how you see yourself and how others give you feedback and see you. So a lot of times we think that the window that we're keeping closed, the facade, the one where we bring our representative to the table instead of our true selves, uh, those windows, people can see them. Even though we think people can't see it, people can see it. And so we cannot keep our windows closed. We have to manage them. Now, I'm not saying open all your windows. If you grew up, and I grew up in Louisiana, born and raised, um, for any of you who grew up in any level of the country, my grandmother used to let the windows up in the summertime to let some fresh air in, right? And so sometimes you got to let some windows up, open up some windows to let some fresh air in. But sometimes when it's cold or you have situations that you need to deal with, you probably need to keep those windows closed. And then on the flip side of that, with your own identity and what you bring to the marriage, you have to make sure that you're not closing yourself off and keeping windows closed that really should be opened because it makes it better for you and your spouse and overall the marriage. Okay, okay. Well, you know, I, I like to go right to the, you know, the windows. Like, so if you're saying if you open the windows and so should we keep the windows closed or what should we do with the windows? You got to know how to manage them. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of that chapter. And that chapter gives a lot of good examples of how you should manage your windows. Uh, Kwame, your windows could be totally different from mine. You know, my window could be, I was always um, chastised when I was small. So anytime I'm around authority, I shut down. Well, I can't do that because in theory, my husband is a level of authority. If he says something that I don't like and I shut down and not talk, now he thinks that it's something wrong with him. When in fact, it could have been something that triggered me from a childhood instance that caused me to shut down. So we have to make sure that we don't close things off behind those windows that would be a detriment to our marriage. Okay, well, you know, now I want to go to the other side because you both wrote this book, Maximizing Your Marriage. And I, and I think you wrote it from a biblical perspective because both of you are heavily involved in the church. Is that correct? Yes, we're both uh, clergy. Right. And you wrote it from a, a biblical perspective, which means that, you know, hey, you, you, every, once you get married, you should just stay married and that should be it, right? And you should never get divorced. I, I, you know, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I know how it goes, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, should do it. I got it. Um, but, you know, I, this is always real talk, so I got to bring another perspective to the table. You know, there's some people that just don't need to be married to each other. Um, you know, you, you know, some people marry when they're really, really young and then they get older and they just realize this is not the person. This is this is not. You know what I want for my life. Some people are in abusive relationships, whether it's mentally, whether it's physically, uh, whether it's financially. And it's just not right for them. Uh, does this book address where sometimes people may need to get out of a marriage and not be in something that's not healthy for them or their family Absolutely. or their kids. Absolutely, Kwame. I know in my chapters, um, I touch on it and Victor touches on it in his chapters as well. But I definitely say in um, chapter, um, chapter 11, who told you love didn't hurt? Um, I was adamant that anything that makes me feel bad is wrong. But we also have to remember that we're two people trying to get to know each other to become one. So offenses will happen. Uh, abuse should not, period. Right. Offenses may happen, but abuse should never happen. And so when I asked my pastor at the time, you know, I told him, I said, well, love shouldn't hurt. I'm tired of this. I went in and talked to him because Victor was getting on my nerves and you know, I'm like, I need to talk to somebody because uh, I might not go back in that house after today if he keeps acting the way he's acting. So my bishop said, I said, Bishop, love does not hurt. He was like, what are you talking about? Who said that? And so he gave me the biblical principle about Jesus and how he died on the cross. He didn't do anything to die on the cross, but that was pain. But it was also love. So I think a lot of times people look at um, love hurting as a way of saying it's abuse. But it's not just abuse. Many times we don't look at it from an emotional perspective to say, I don't really know Victor. I don't really know Sorelda. So that's why we're going to stay married for life if there is no abuse taking place, obviously. Um, and we have to figure it out. We have to learn to, to know each other. And sometimes 
collateral damage happens along the way. Not okay. a big. Okay, well, I, and I hear you, but I know that there's some that's going to say, look, I've been with this person for 15 years, or I've been with this person for 20 years, and, you know, I've been, you know, dealing with this hurt for 12 of the 20 years. Or I've been dealing with this hurt for the last seven, eight years. The hurt's not going away. And I'm getting, you know, older, right? And I'm, I'm old enough to understand that something, I'll say this word again, don't get mad at me. It ain't right, right? It ain't feeling right. It is not supposed to be right. And I'm miserable. Now I'm trying, I'm praying, I'm doing all the stuff I'm supposed to be doing. But there's no way that you should be in a situation that's complicated. There's no way that you should be in a situation that hurts all the time. There's no way in a situation that you know that is mentally and, f and physically draining you, right? It might not be abuse from physical abuse, but it's mentally draining, right? And, you know, do you ever think there's a time when it's, it's okay uh, to say, hey, this ain't working and to, you know, go your separate way and still keep your relationship with your, your kids? And is, is, it, is it ever a time to say bye? I guess I don't know any good way to put it. So they say, bye, this ain't working. I tried, I gotta go, because if I don't and I stay here, it's not good for my health. Well, I would definitely tell you uh, with my husband and I, we've gone through several different seasons of, I don't wanna be here, well, I don't wanna be here either. Well, I can leave, well, I can leave too. Well, I'm marketable, well, I'm marketable too. Then we can just go our separate ways. Sure, I got a payroll number, I got a payroll number too, you know, so, the fact that we were both professionals, we have always had a two income household. Um, we never really felt the sting of any financial problems. So that was never a thing for us. Um, we are both very driven. And I think what we had to do is balance how we could be driven together. We have our individual pursuits and our individual exploits, but it almost destroyed our marriage. It really almost destroyed our marriage because we were still trying to operate um, walking parallel to each other instead of converging. We never converged at a certain point in our lives and in our marriage. And we had to stop and say, if we don't learn how to compromise and complement, like one of the chapters, compete, complete, or complement, if we don't learn to complement each other in this marriage, we will not be in a marriage. We will have to resolve this marriage. So my answer to your question is there were times where we even wanted to separate there were times where we even said well when we were stationed in germany um well we can't get a divorce here but when we go back to the states that's it okay fine that's it but we actually had counseling we had counseling with our pastors and they basically kind of walked us through it because sometimes you think you're so upset where this is uh, irreconcilable but really we just have to process our thoughts there are situations, of course, Kwame, where some people grow apart. Now, as a, as a Christian, and I believe in everything that the Bible says, uh, however, there are instances in the Bible that talk about um, divorce there, uh, and, and how you can separate. But some people, like you said, should have never been uh, married in the first place. So right, that's, and, that's, and, that's, and, and that, was, that was, first of all, I knew that was always a tough question for those that are clergy, right? It's just, it's just always hard. It's never, they're never going to tell me, yeah, right? Because it just doesn't happen. But I have been around long enough. And, you know, my aunt was a bishop. My mom was a pastor. I've been around, right? So I've seen people in relationships and their kids knew they were in bad relationships. And the church told them to stay in this bad relationship. And the bad relationship was just so bad that after a while, the kids then got turned off because they got older and they knew that this pastor should have never told them that they should have stayed there, that their mama should have stayed in this relationship, and it just caused a whole lot of, you know, they didn't say it the way you're saying it, right? And sometimes people do grow apart, right? You can't bring people back together that don't want to be back together, right? That's you can't so make true. someone stay with you that don't want to stay, and you can, but the relationship is not going to be good, right? And you can pray all you want to God. And only God can change the person, but if the person don't want to change, then they ain't going to make no difference, 
right? You'll be and, in an arranged entanglement. That's what and, you'll be in. You'll be. <laughs> and then, you, you know, you wake up and you'll be 70 years old and thinking, my goodness, where did time go? Where did my life go? Then you're resentful. You're resentful to everyone. Then, you, you know, you start trying to resent God for keeping you in that, in that relationship that was foolish, which is not healthy for anyone's soul. But I, I have to say that because it's always real talk and I always like to bring different perspectives uh, to, the, to the table. This book really focuses on how, because I, I, there, are some, there are some reviews on this book, and I, I want to grab them because I, I really like the reviews that I looked at on the book where, you know, one of them said that this is a book for people that are, for married couples and for those people that are single. And they're saying if you're single, take a look at the book because if you're single, you think about getting married, hey, take a look at the book so you kind of know what you get, what you get. You know, we want you to go to, what do you call that? You want to go to counseling and, and all the stuff you do, premarital counseling and all, that's what you do. Go do that, but go take a look at the book so you can get some real in-depth understanding about what the window means and what the grass means and <laughs> what the love language means. We're going to get into the love language with your husband because I, I was trying to figure out what the love language means, right? So, because if you don't know my love language and I don't know your love language and I don't like your love language and you don't like my love language, then that's a problem because we can't, we ain't going to never, I said, ain't again, we're never going to connect, right? Because you, if I don't like to give you your love language and you don't like to give me my love language, then that's a problem, right? Then I got to go to who told you love don't hurt, right? Then I got to go to that chapter and I got to read that chapter and see what's going on with that chapter. So do you have, walk me through, because you guys wrote this book, you counseling people, Walk me through maybe a, a story that you was able to, someone was able to be inspired by what they saw. Because looking at some of the reviews, I mean, they were just wonderful reviews, everything on your book. Everyone had great things to say about the book and how it helped them and how it influenced them uh, to, one, either keep going or, two, to realize that <laughs> they were in a real serious problem and they need to go see a pastor or a clergy or someone. Because after reading your book, they say, hey, yep, that's me. I got to go talk to someone. So your book has inspired. It's helped but it's also enlighten people on what they need to do to get out of it. Tell me about a story that you guys, because you guys work together, right? Right. Okay, so it's like the husband, wife, and then I come in, and then you and your husband, you sit down, you talk, he gives me the male perspective, you give me the female perspective, y'all both beat me up, and then I go home and my marriage is, is happy ever after because now I have a better understanding. But walk me through, because you use your book in some of your, 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 your counseling, is that correct? Yeah, coaching, because we are coaching. not licensed counselors. Right, coaching. Uh, but we do a lot of marriage coaching. Uh, I think people are turned off a lot of times when you say the word counseling for some reason. And so because we are also not certified counselors, we, um, you know, take the angle of marriage coaching. Because basically we're coaching from our experience, from our biblical perspectives, and uh, from, from this life. So basically at some point it depends on who contacts us, right? Uh, my husband could have someone at his job that happens to be a woman who knows that we, you know, wrote a book and they may ask him and he in turn will probably, you know, normally he'll contact me and we'll talk together. Or if it's just a random, you know, casual conversation, they may read the book and say, hey, I have so many notes in this book. I'm glad you all put a journal inside of the book behind each chapter so that I can process my thoughts because it helps me and then they'll call and then on the other hand uh, we had one couple that's been married for over 12 years um, another situation where finances is never an argument in their family very wealthy very young under 35 I believe in millionaires and uh, for whatever reason they went through situations where the wife felt she was not loved she was not feeling beautiful in spite of the millions you know of dollars that they make and they read the book and they were like wow we have drifted so far away from the core of why we got married and that information that was in the book shared that we shared with them changed their life it changed their marriage and awesome. i'm so happy that they are still together well hey that's a that's awesome and that's why we wanted to have uh, both you and your husband on to really talk about the life-changing book that you guys produced and wrote and how it's changing people's lives. I mean, if you go in there, Sports 13.7, I think that was a, someone who wrote uh, a review saying it's a relatable content for all couples, which after, after looking at the chapters, clearly, I mean, I, I still got to get to the love language and the Garden of Eve from the serpents. <laughs> 
uh, you know, we're going to get there with, with, with uh, Dr. Herbin. And then Sigma, who wrote, great book to add to your marriage maintenance plan, which is, which is interesting. Say, hey, take the book, read it. Even if you think everything's going well, read the book anyway, right? Because there could be some things you're overlooking by not uh, reading uh, to read the book. So once again, where can folks find you? We are on Amazon.com. You can find our book there. Uh, you can also reach us at um, Vic and Sorrell the Herbin at gmail.com if you would like an autographed copy. And we appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you um, seeking interest in the book. We wrote the book not to become millionaires, but we wrote the book to connect with other people so that their marriages can be better. So we definitely appreciate your patronage. We definitely appreciate your uh, input and comments as well. We we appreciate those um, all of those reviews that are on Amazon and the emails and the inboxes that we get on Facebook. Thank you all so much uh, for oh. those who have already purchased. So I appreciate that, Kwame, for bringing that up. No, awesome. I mean, look, once again, we know the holidays is here. Uh, first, I want to say to you and your family, my prayers will continue to be with you. I know you guys are, you know, getting over COVID, but to have the whole family test for COVID is, ooh, God is good because you're here, you're interviewing, uh, you're not giving any negative reports. So we thank God for that. Um, so to, we, we want to talk about during this time of the year is also Thanksgiving and it's also Christmas which means people are going to be finding different things uh, to get people as a gift. And we're just mm -hmm. saying, if you're going to get a gift, and we all know if you're going to gift today, you're not going to a store to get a gift, right? We all know that. You're going to go on the internet, you're going to click, you're going to click a button, and when you click the button, they're going to deliver something to a house. So all I'm saying is go get the book, <laughs> Amazing, I mean, uh, Maximizing Marriage, and get it for your family, get it for your friends. So on Amazon, matter of fact, I clicked it in there and it's just, it's everywhere. It's a whole bunch of different places. We'll put it up on the screen a little bit later. You'll see where you can go get the book from. Go get it. It's going to change. It may not change your life, but it will change the life of someone you give the book to. So the most important thing is to get the book out. Dr. Herbin, thank you for coming on Always Real Talk. We appreciate it. Uh, tell uh, Dr. Victor Herbin, Serbin, that, we, uh, Herbin, that we're going to be uh, coming to talk to him. But he's probably already looking at what you're doing right now. So then now when I ask him the questions, he's already going to know what the questions are and be ready for he's it. But he's in a man cave. <laughs> hey, look, look, but it won't be me because we got someone else going to sit down, and talk to him. We got a female sit down, and talk to him about his book and we'll let her, you know, talk the way she wants to talk in terms of doing it. We really appreciate you taking time to come to Always Real Talk. And this is Kwame Brown. And if it's Always Real Talk, you know it's going to be real.